Coming up next on Arizona Horizons, Journalists Roundtable will discuss the business community's efforts to fight an increase in Arizona's minimum wage, and we'll talk about how out-of-state officials are voicing opposition to Arizona's ballot measure to legalize marijuana. Journalists Roundtable is next on Arizona Horizons. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Arizona PBS, members of your PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizons Journalists Roundtable. I'm Ted Simons. Joining us tonight, Mary Jo Pitzel of the Arizona Republic, Howard Fisher of Capital Media Services, and Luigi Del Puerto of the Arizona Capital Times. Three weeks to go before early voting in Arizona and the campaigns are gearing up. Mary Jo, we got the Get Out the Vote campaigns gearing up as well. Yeah, all sorts of things happening. But ballot harvesting, that's still not going to happen, is it? Um, no. I mean, we have a state law that took effect in early August that said um, you can't collect other people's ballots, you know, with a couple of exceptions for family members and caregivers. But the Democrats, both state and nationally, have been trying to challenge this and get that law at least suspended for this election and ultimately nuke it. Um, but they've, uh, they lost their first effort. Um, a federal judge today ruled that um, he sees no reason to grant an injunction to withhold the um, effect of the ballot harvesting law. So um, it will be um, in effect for November 8th. And what's really important is one of the things that Democrats were saying is Voting Rights Act, even though preclearance has disappeared, says you cannot enact laws that dis disproportionately affect minority voters. The judge said, great, where's the data? The lawyer said, oh, well, just take our word for it, Your Honor. You know, we wouldn't lie to you. And the judge said, how do I use this? He said, I have nothing that shows that minorities are, are adversely affected. I have nothing that shows that people are going to have a harder time voting. There are many ways to cast a ballot. You can't find the mailbox near your house. So, you know, a, a home per, a person can take it in. There's even laws that say counties have to send people to the homes of the disabled to help them vote. So he said, I don't see a hardship here. Right, and the and judge says, show me the data. And when the Democrats said, well, look at these anecdotes that we have, the, the <laughs> judge essentially said, well, I have my own anecdotes too, and they're just as good as yours. And so I can't really rely on your stories to, to rule against this law. Yeah. And um, in addition, the judge said, um, not only that you can't prove that this will impact disproportionately minority voters, but you can't also prove that this would have a burden on Arizonans' uh, right to vote. Right. Um, nonetheless, um, the Democrats are taking this up. They're appealing this up to the Ninth Circuit Court. They announced that a, a couple hours after this order came down today. So, so it only rejects the injunction. The court case goes on. Right. The yeah. underlying case is going to proceed. And real quickly, Howie, just explain, for those who aren't sure what ballot harvesting or ballot collection means, quickly. Very explain what this is all about. I get an early ballot because I'm on the permanent early voting list. Now, I can put it back in the mailbox. I can take it in our election day, or if I'm busy, under the old law, I could give it to Luigi and say, hey, while you're running by, take it back. This law says the only people I can give it to, family members, household members, caregivers. If I give it to Luigi, he's committing a felony, could go to, to prison for a year. Unless you're my brother. Unless, then, yes. Then it's fine. And so you've got, you've got questions in there. The Republicans are saying this is rife with the possibility for fraud, even as they admit there isn't a single instance of fraud. And again, yeah. one more time for why this law is necessary. Well, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, Republicans have been saying that this is rife for fraud and that, and that there might be the possibility that people will use this to manipulate the vote. And of course, as Howie had mentioned, uh, as had been mentioned uh, you know, by a whole lot of people, including county officials, several times, there is no evidence of that happening. What really triggered this, I think, was the Russell Pierce um, recall a couple years ago, and the Citizens for a Better Arizona went out and brought in like a, a, a box full of ballots to the, sealed ballots, but the, you know, it, uh, brought in a big box of ballots to elections officials and. People saw that and said, hmm, you know, how do, how do we know how people voted on those ballots? Yeah. And then it was magnified by, I believe it was last Look. cycle, there was a fellow who walked into county elections office. He was caught on the, you know, in office camera, and he also brought in a big but, box But let's of also understand the partisan nature of this thing. The fact is Democrats are better at sending out community groups to gather these than Republicans are. It's been very clear. 
In fact, Michelle Reagan, when she was pushing the thing, went to the Conservative Political Action Conference and said, these leftists are doing this and they're undermining the, uh, you know, the integrity of the election. This is partisan. Okay, with this in mind, Luigi, um, didn't the county basically say, this is a wonderful law, but we just we can't yeah. enforce this? I mean, <laughs> is it even going to be enforceable? R I mean, really, that is the question. How are you going to enforce this? And what are the mechanisms for making sure that people follow this law? And when they presumably violate this law, how do you go about, you know, enforcing it? Really, that is the question. Yes. Now, right. the, 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 Which goes to the issue of when Luigi walks with my ballot and they look at the two of us and say, of course he's my brother. Of course. <laughs> uh, and, and the judge, but the judge also said, you know, one of the, the arguments that Democrats put forward in this case is that, look, it is hard for people in some areas to have uh, a, a, an efficient mail system, a mailing system, the, the, you know, the regular courier system. But the judge said, well, it's true for minority areas, but also true for areas that have a, 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 you know, a larger... Uh, white uh, majority. And so, ag again, the judge kept saying, show me the evidence, give me data. And, and of course, what ha you know, what's, what's going to happen is that the, uh, the Dem Democrats are going to appeal this case. Um, as far as the trial court, it's going to make it a little bit tougher for Democrats to show in the underlying case and, and win, uh, you know, and, and get this uh, law knocked down. And probably what's going to hurt those efforts, too, is that we had an election with the ballot harvesting law in effect, and it was August 30th, and yeah. we saw no reports of anybody coming in with batches of ballots, um, no complaints lodged. Um, but as you pointed out, the counties are going to basically, if somebody walks in with a bunch of ballots, they're going to accept them because state law says you got to take all, all, the, all the ballots. So oh. it would be up to others to bring a challenge. There you go. All right, um, uh, moving on here. It uh, looks like business groups, Howie, have finally <laughs> launched their campaign. We had a debate last night, and it looks like the campaign has started against minimum wage increases in Arizona. Mm -hmm. It's an uphill fight, though. Oh, yeah. Well, somebody finally woke up Glenn Hammer, and he said, hey, three weeks till, till you know, early voting. And they realized that uh, the Restaurant Association, which has led the fight against this in the past, is not going to carry this on its own. So they formed a campaign committee. They're going to start gathering some money. They're going to do debates like they did here and hope to convince folks that the current law, 805 an hour plus automatic inflation increases, is just fine and everyone can live on that. This, as you say, is an uphill fight, not only because of the fact there's only three weeks left, not only because of the fact the polling shows the thing passing two to one, but you have a national movement that suggests perhaps $15 an hour is appropriate. And it's going to be really hard to convince folks that 805 an hour, which is 16000 and change a year, you can actually support, speed a family on. And not, not only the polls show that this is going to pass, and some of the polls are showing this is going to pass by a two to one margin, Arizona has a history of approving uh, increases to the minimum wage and we did we did it a decade ago mm -hmm. back then there wasn't really a whole lot of opposition to it now maybe we'll see the uh, the, the, the the you know they tr the business community tried so hard to make sure that this thing does not get on the ballot and now that it is with three weeks left to go they're saying we need a seven figure investment to uh, to stop mm -hmm. it it's funny though uh, there was some opposition to it last time oh, and yes. some of that opposition sounds like the same arguments this go around it is the same you know it was the opposition a decade ago was led uh, by the restaurant association um, they're front and center but they need they needed help to wage this fight this time which is why the chamber finally jumped in and yeah it's a it's a hard argument did we have restaurants that went out of business because of the minimum wage increase at the same time I think we had an extension of um, of we, we toughened up our um, liquor license, our, our DUI laws, right. which uh, affected how much time people were going to spend at establishments. Um, there were a couple of other factors that were happening, and we've had a recession along the way. And, and real quickly, um, I know that in the debate last night, Glenn Hammer, who you mentioned, uh, Arizona Chamber of Commerce and Industry, the, the head honcho there, he was here debating this, and he was saying it's different because it, it, 10 years ago, you did not have the automation taking so many jobs away, mm -hmm. and that makes it a different playing field, and that's why more jobs will be lost if this increase well, goes into there effect. Are two problems with that. The automation has been occurring anyway. If you go into a Ruby Tuesday now, you can sit at the bar, order on a little computer, get your fries refill on the computer, swipe your card on the computer, and basically only deal with the person who brings you your food. So the automation is going to happen anyway. Number two is 
Some jobs just can't be automated. As soon as we find somebody who can make up the beds in the hotel and put a mint on the pillow, then I'll worry about I it. I like to think the host of Arizona Horizon is somewhat safe in that regard. Well, let's see. <laughs> uh, there's an interesting uh, show to be had on that one. <laughs> All right, uh, Luigi, we're talking about minimum wage. Uh, the anti-marijuana, uh, what is it, to 205, Prop 205. Yes. They finally, they got some folks coming out here from Colorado where marijuana mm -hmm. is legalized. It, but they were against Arizona's law, kind of, sort of, right? <laughs> oh, it's not, not only just kind of, sort of, but the folks that were from Colorado, who the, the uh, anti-marijuana recreational uh, me ballot measure uh, critics have brought into Arizona, those guys said, well, you know, if, if uh, Colorado were to put this uh, back on the ballot again, it's probably still going to pass. <laughs> and, that, and that's the crucial thing. Right. You know, the fact is, the mayor of Colorado has a chutzpah to come down here. Colorado Springs. Colorado, Colorado Springs, sorry. Co to come down here and say, you should learn from our mistakes. And, uh, you know, and, and I'm an elected mayor, and I believe in, in the vote of the people, but my residents still like it. He also admitted that some of the data showing an increase in teen drug use since the 2012 measure was passed, actually the increase was before and then finally, he also has said, you know what the better solution is? Maybe you should just decriminalize marijuana, make it a petty offense, at which point Bill Montgomery's head exploded, and that was the end of that. I was going to say, Jaws must have fallen straight to the ground after that comment. Right. That's, that is not where the opponents are going in this state. They, they just don't, do not want to see re a recreational marijuana legalization at all. Um, I'm interested that they haven't yet raised the question about the effect on bordering states. I was looking at a report today where there was an analysis done to find out if... Um, marijuana arrests in neighboring Nebraska, which neighbors Colorado, they're up. Um, why is that? Well, the study said, you know, we can't conclusively say that it's because of the law in, Cal in Colorado, but most of those arrests are well, happening let, in western go, Nebraska, which is right. And let's go a step border. beyond that. California has a legalization measure on the ballot. True. You can bet if for some reason it doesn't get legalized here, a lot of folks are going to say, you know, in a couple of hours, I'm yeah. in El Centro and uh, get, get what I need. These negative uh, campaigns against uh, uh, legalization of marijuana, are they effective? Is it effective to get people from Colorado coming down here and to varying degrees uh, saying we shouldn't have done this? Well, what's going to be effective if they, stay, if they can compound this message, make sure that it's funded, repeat it, run, you know, a, 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 a perhaps a multi-million dollar TV campaign against this measure, that would have a real impact on voters because uh, again, what we know for sure, let me backtrack a bit, the opposition to recreational marijuana is more organized. There are more public officials that have said, you know, we're going to join this fight against this ballot measure when compared to medical, uh, the, the uh, medical marijuana ballot measure a couple of years ago. So yes, it is more organized, but in my mind, it, it boils down to money, and messaging. And as long as you have a ton of money behind your message, yes, you can have an impact. Okay, but now we're down to what that message is. There is a message to be, to be sold to voters. There are many flaws in this measure. The limited number of dispensaries, questions about DUI and, and per se limits like they have on alcohol. If the message becomes reefer madness that, oh my God, we're going to legalize marijuana, we're all going to die, people are going to take it with a grain of salt. So they've got to be real careful with that message. And the pro side now has a new ad out pushing the idea that, that this money will be going to Arizona schools. It's a great thing for education. It is. That's, <laughs> uh, that's always, isn't that always the pitch? You know, this is, going to, this is going to help the schools. And my goodness, after Prop 123, and if this passes, that you'd think the schools would just be rolling in the dough, but wait until we get to the right. legislative what, what, session. Yeah, why, why not get high at the same time that you're uh, <laughs> providing for your schools, right? All right. That's a nice thought, Luigi. Um, <laughs> Joe Arpaio, apparently it just goes on as far as the cost. Now we've got legal fees to mm -hmm. plaintiff's attorneys. This is, they've already been paid close to $5 million for the case, the, uh, the racial profiling case. Now for the contempt of court, they're getting paid for $4.5 yes. million dollars for their efforts. It never stops. Well, we're up to what's $44, $45 million now, mm -hmm. um, you know, which you figure in a county of six and a half million people, you know, look in your wallet and you know, take out four bucks and just hand it to Joe at this point. You, you know, this has been one of the things for years. Opponents have said Joe is costing us money, not only in terms of the legal fees, the fines, the, the, the monitoring, everything else, and none of it is stuck. Now, the question is, does somebody look at the $44 million and say, this is the year we get rid of them? 
we've talked how many times around this table about, oh, this is the year voters are finally going to say no to Joe. I, you know, you lose a lot of money. You know, you that. mentioned 44. Some are saying it's already 48. The county yeah. is expecting it to be up to $72 million once all this legalization is right. done. And they can't really say no mm -hmm. to these to these fees um, or the, these costs because Arpaio has been sued in his capacity as an elected official sheriff of Maricopa County. So they're sort of on the hook, you know, um, even though um, perhaps a lot of people object to the amount of money that's being spent. That decision, whether this continues, and even if, even if Arpaio were to lose, um, th there's still going to be the more of these costs accruing. Right, and the political question, as we mentioned, is that the, does the, do the voters of Maricopa County say, look, enough is enough, we're not going to pay for this, we're not going to have this anymore, and we're going to replace him. But I, I just don't see that happening, not this year. You, so you, you still think, with all of this stuff, he's reelected? Right, and there are many reasons for that. One is that Sheriff Joe remains to be very popular in Maricopa County, and two, he has a, a you know a ton of money. Last time we looked, was he has uh, five, six million, or something like that. But and and it, 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 it's it's. But Luigi, hold on a second here. Now. The five, six million gets your name out there. Gets all. I mean, it's not just everyone knows who Joe Arpaio is. No, I, I mean, unless you're living at the bottom of a well, you you know who Joe Arpaio is. Is he hit a point where he has jumped the shark to where? the less advertising is the better because the more you start thinking about Joe Arpaio, you're going, hmm. And, and you're right. He has a universal name ID in, in, in the county, perhaps in Arizona as well. But, you know, the voters in this county have time and I mean, these are not new concerns raised against Sheriff Joe. These concerns have been raised against him year after election year, and he's always won his race. Okay. Uh, food stamp fraud case, we've talked about this. Uh, C.C. Velasquez, the, the Democratic lawmaker, uh, three low-level felonies charged. It came down to one misdemeanor, uh, but she pleads, and she pleads guilty. Yes, I, uh, I think that's a clear sign. She just wants this thing to go away. It's not, it's not a happy thing to deal with. Um, there are attorney costs associated with this, um, but it does sort of make you wonder, you know, it was quite a big splash when um, her um, uh, indictments were, were announced. Uh, explain the splash here. What, what exactly is the story about how? Because we're well, talking like $1,700 worth of food stamp fraud. Well, the, the amounts may sound small as opposed to, you know, you read headlines about $3 million or something like this. People are very sensitive to this. You know, almost every year at the legislature, we get a bill about food stamp fraud, and you're taking money out of the pockets of people who are hardworking Arizonans. So to have a legislator go ahead and be guilty of playing a little fast and loose in terms of, of the rules about food stamps, what you can charge, what you can't charge, how to process it, you know, that, that goes a long way. But there was, there was some conversation on whether or not this was overreach as far as the, the, the magnitude of the crime. Right, and in fact there was. It's seven, Howie's right, you know, it's a small amount and people are saying, do we go into litigation and spend you know, uh, scores of thousands of dollars over seven hundred dollars that presumably uh, the uh, representative C.C. Velasquez had, uh, you know, defrauded the state with. But, but then, uh, let me backtrack a bit. Um, settling a case uh, and pleading it to something lower than what you were charged for, it's it's very normal. And, you know, it, it, it's normal with, with the, uh, the prosecutor's office, whether it's the city or, or, or the county or the state. I mean, they do this all the time. Well, they, that's why they overcharge. Right. I mean, right. this is part of the game. It's sort of like you go into a car dealership. Hey, the car is $19,000. i will tell you what. If I give you fifteen nine, can I get it out the door? And we should mention that the, the agreement does not say that she is forced from office. But she's not running for re-election. No, she pretty uh, early on said, look, I'm not going to run for, for re-election. Um, she does retain her seat through um, the early January. All right, Luigi, uh, Representative Jay Lawrence has filed a complaint with the Attorney General's office regarding the city of Phoenix. Yes, the city of Phoenix recently adopted uh, an, an, uh, an ID for undocumented residents. And, and th that, that by itself is very controversial, especially you know, with the nation in uproar, or at least some parts of the nation in uproar, over um, uh, so-called sanctuary cities. And Jay Lawrence, a representative from Scottsdale, said, well, I'm not going to stand for it. I'm going to go, I'm gonna go after the city of Phoenix and file the complaint but filed with the wrong form initially with the attorney uh, general's office because there's now a new law that says, well, if you believe, and you're a lawmaker, you believe that any city has violated state law or the Constitution, you can file a complaint with the attorney general's so office. So initially he files, files it incorrectly. So the second time he files it. He, he said he had filed the second time, but the attorney general's office said, we still have not received that 
uh, second complaint. Now, our reporter did receive that second complaint from, uh, from Jay, uh, yeah. but the Attorney General's office said, not us. Well, 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 I think your reporter should pass it on, since obviously Jay can't find the AG's He has office. to run as a, as a legislator first, and then win. And then, <laughs> only then can he pass it along. So basically what office. he's saying is Phoenix is, an, is a sanctuary city by issuing these ID cards that breaks the state law, and he's basically threatening Phoenix, as they all do with municipalities, with state shared revenue. Um, right, and is this the first case where we've had a lawmaker invoking no, that law? No, no, yeah, we have Paul Boyer, and, and the difference, we had Paul Boyer uh, going after, I think, the town Town Snowflake. of Snowflake, Snowflake over for that, uh, the, 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 the pot marijuana. capital of Arizona, yeah, yeah. apparently. The, the big difference there is that in, in Paul Blair's case, he copied and pasted the complaint that was filed by a lawyer in, in a separate, a non actual case. He copied and pasted it and said, Well, hey, here's my complaint. In Jay Lauren's case, it doesn't seem like he had any help. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I guess that's one way to look at it there, Luigi. Although it sounds like he's going to get help for the third try. Um, I, I, I should, I should, well, I'm still waiting for the Attorney General's office to say, well, yeah, we got that second complaint. All right, uh, we're moving on. Howie, apparently, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, changing a diaper in Arizona is now possibly against the law. Well, it, the question always is, it may have been. always been. We have a law in Arizona that says it is child molesting to intentionally or knowingly touch the private parts of, of, a, of a baby. No question about that. Um, the law does say that if and when you're charged and if you go to, the, to court, then you can raise what they call affirmative defense to say, well, I didn't do it with sexual intent, i.e., I was changing a diaper. We had a case come to the Supreme Court of a person who was accused of touching the private parts of his step-grandchildren, and his attorneys raised the question of saying, wait, shouldn't the prosecutor have to prove that this, in fact, was not with sexual intent? And the court ruled three to two, said, no, there's nothing wrong with it, and don't worry, there's nothing to worry about. No less than Scott Bales, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, said, wait a second, why should you have to be arrested, handcuffed, charged, indicted, put on trial before you get to plead that out? And you know, the, the, the majority said, oh, there's not a problem here. But it turns out, I did some checking, there actually is a case in Arizona where a foster parent was in fact charged and had to go to court to, ha to be acquitted before, before this. So this is a real issue. So basically, this is the accused have to prove it was not molestation, not the Correct. prosecutor, uh, the right, accused. Right, the fundamental question was whether it is up to the state to prove that, or rather, let me, let me rephrase that. The fundamental question was whether the burden uh, to prove that a defendant uh, did not have a sexual intent in touching a child uh, lies with the state or with the defendant. The majority said no, it, it is with the defendant. The defendant has to prove there was no sexual intent in, in the act. Yeah. So all of this means that we most likely will see some proposed legislation um, in 2017. And um, it will, um, at least by early indications, would be vigorously fought by, for example, Maricopa County Attorney Bill Montgomery, who says he doesn't think there's any need yeah. for that, that things work fine. And you know, who's gonna bring a ridiculous lawsuit over somebody for who's just changing their kiddo's diaper? Which gets back, to, A, to the case that, that did, in fact, go through the court system, but B, it assumes, you know, hey, if you can't trust your prosecutor, who can you trust? Well, look, we all know the old joke, you know, prosecutor can indict a ham sandwich yeah. if they want to. So the question becomes, should the law be clarified to restrain an overzealous prosecutor from bringing charges and then forcing the, the parent? Look, I have washed the bottoms of, I have two grandchildren. Two He's grandchildren. He's accused. He's accused. <laughs> I have washed. The, 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 the bottoms of, of my granddaughters, and I don't want to be in a situation where suddenly somebody says, well, you know, you spent too much time there, or you did this, and you had a sexual intent. That scares me. Right, and, and the majority did, in fact, hint about uh, the need perhaps to clarify this law and say, look, well, you know, let's let's make sure that we know exactly what we're going after. We're not going after innocent parents. And, and this Here. has been done in other states. I mean, this is not um, unplowed territory. There, you know, there are models to be looked at. All right, uh, we will stop it right there.
As crazy as that sounds, we will stop it right there. Yes. Good to have you all here. Thanks for joining us. Monday on Air is on a horizon. Phoenix Mayor Greg Stanton joins us in studio to discuss a variety of city issues. And we'll preview the first presidential debate from an Arizona perspective. That's Monday at 530. And then join us again at 8 and 1030 after the presidential debate for full analysis right here on Arizona Horizon. Tuesday. How conservationists work to keep track of hummingbirds as they migrate. Wednesday, a debate between Congressional District 1 candidates Paul Babu and Tom O'Halloran. A CD1 debate. Again, that is Wednesday. Mark that down. Thursday, we'll hear about a local Saudi Arabian-owned farming operation. And Friday, it's another edition of the Journalists' Roundtable. We have a lot going on. If you want to catch up to what we've done, what we plan on doing, or what we just did tonight, check us out. azpbs.org slash horizon. That's azpbs.org slash horizon. That is it for now. Shakus. Shakus. <laughs> I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great weekend. is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Arizona PBS, members of your PBS station. Thank you.